William de Graeff, uh, Secretary General of Europa Bio, representing the biotech industries of Europe. I mean, you feel that the future is actually rather brighter than many people are painting it. As a technologist, we've never doubted our ability to feed the current world population and to feed the projected increase of the population. So in terms of available tools to get the job done, I'm very optimistic indeed. But tools only do the job if they are deployed. And deploying tools is a matter of political economy. And the economic side of that I have a lot of confidence in. When politics steps in, of course, then we have to be really careful, really convincing to say to politicians there is one thing that you cannot deny. If you don't, if you don't do it wrong, we will feed the world. But you can do it wrong with wrong policies. Now in, in Russia, you, you cited the example to me of, of Russia being a, a case where the whole industry has been turned around. I can remember a, a, a farmer friend who went to Russia and was shocked to see fields being left idle simply because the workers had finished their working day and uh, the, the, the crops rotted while the people were hungry. That's all changed. Well, it became even worse after the Soviet Union imploded. I just saw a presentation where somebody said, look around the Black Sea, Russia, Ukraine and Kazakhstan in the last 20 years took out of production 20 million hectares of highly fertile soil. Just putting in the investment to put those things back into production using current best technologies, you have a reserve there of 150 to 200 million tons of cereals per year. Wouldn't we have loved to have those two years ago? What went wrong? I mean, why was that amount of land, a very fertile land, taken out of production in the first place? Uh, lack of money, lack of inputs, uh, no replacement for all tractors, no money, mostly no money for the farmers to buy the tools with which to do the job. The land was still there, the water was still falling on it, the hard-working farmers were probably still there as well. But the farmer is a businessman. He needs working capital in order to deliver. If there is no banks to lend him money, if there is no shops to sell him the spare parts of his tractor and the seeds and his fertilizer, then nothing's going to happen. What we see in recent years, and that is the very good news, is that yields in Ukraine and Russia are spectacularly rebounding precisely because those tools for the farmer to do his job are re-entering the country. Are there lessons from that for Europe? Because Europe is fairly intensively um, farmed anyway. Well, in Europe we talk about sustainability always as sort of equaling extensification of agriculture. But the Biodiversity Convention tells us that the biggest threat to biodiversity worldwide is using new agricultural lands. So what we really learn is we need to produce as much as possible sustainably on as little land as possible. And that is what the Russians and the Ukrainians are at this moment doing. And yes, so we can learn from that rebound of agriculture in that area of the world. Getting more out of less land, though, sounds like an ideal solution, but it's, it's difficult to achieve at the same time as, as making the land environmentally sound and so on, which is one of the other parts of the CAP and of the proposed reforms to the CAP. Well, the strange thing is that if you leave land alone for a while, it has a tendency to rebound magnificently. Uh, the upstate New York area, 100 years ago, completely depopulated because all the farmers went to the Midwest. And it's the place in the world where ecologists these days learn how abandoned farmland becomes new, very biodiverse nature. Similar things are happening. Uh, sometimes we abandon land by must. Think about the disaster of Chernobyl. It's by now fairly widely known that that is one of the most biodiverse areas in Europe. Now, we don't suggest in any way that you should do it that way. What we say is that if you can leave, give land back to the rest of nature, it will use it efficiently. What sort of reforms do you think should be coming in in 2013 uh, and in the years that follow that will make the farming viable for Europe's farmers, but also produce enough food to feed a, a world population of 9 billion by 2020 and possibly 10 billion by 2050? I think we need to look at that in two sides. Uh, I think we need to let developing countries develop their agriculture so they can feed themselves. What Europe can do, because we definitely have the productive capability, is to feed ourselves and produce the half a billion to one billion tons of dry matter surplus to completely renovate our industries so that they run on renewable raw materials, bioplastics, biofuels and everything around. 
More than a thousand people at this conference, a forum for the future of agriculture 2010. I mean, is that encouraging for you? I mean, the numbers attending this event on an annual basis seem to be on the increase. It suggests that there is more awareness of the need to do something. I was massively impressed and I loved it. Finally, agriculture is back on the policy agenda. Maybe we needed the food price shock of two, three years ago and a lot of reflection and realization over the last 24 months that the biggest, both the biggest contributor and the biggest victim of climate change is agriculture. That makes it a top line policy issue again and we welcome the opportunity because as technologists we have a lot of tools to offer in the toolkit for a solution. Biotechnology, you feel, is possibly the, the, the best solution to, in, in terms of dealing with the, the problems of climate change. Are you encouraged by the fact that the Commission has now given the go-ahead for, at last for the, the first GM crop in more than 12 years? And, and it's not a food crop, not basically a food crop anyway. Uh, we don't claim that biotech is the best solution. We claim that in biotech we are delivering a number of tools that provide pretty good answers to high screamed questions drought tolerance, nitrogen use efficiency and so on. And they will only deliver if they are put in a toolbox where we create a systems approach to agriculture that uses all science and technology in order to maximize output while minimizing inputs. And in that respect, yes, we are very confident, we were very happy to see that finally uh, in Europe we've bitten that first bullet and maybe we can start thinking about how biotech can contribute to solving these issues.